Well, good morning, Willingdon Church. Welcome. Let's stand together. Why don't you greet one another as we begin our time of worship for our Lord and Savior today. Those of you watching online, we welcome you as well. Let's enter right into an atmosphere of worship for our God. We worship you, Lord.
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, If anyone be in Christ, he is therefore a new creation. The old has passed away and the new life has begun. Thank the Lord for new life today. Amen. And we just take a moment to bless him. Thank him right now. We thank you, Lord, for our life in you, God. Resurrection life, God. For all things that have passed away. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love!
His power. We have seen Him in His faithfulness, and we give Him praise. We give Him our worship.
so Lord, you alone are worthy of our praise. You are king of the universe, creator of the universe, and our Lord. And so it's with delight and joy and hope and faith and humility that we come before you today. Thank you for the joy of being able to worship you in this community. And I pray, Lord, that as we continue to worship you here today, right now, you would speak to us in ways that we can understand and respond to. Lord, we do not want to leave here without having met with the risen Lord, without having met with the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so would you meet us? shape us, convict us, transform us, do whatever you need to do, Lord, in our hearts and lives so that we can leave here changed because we've been in your presence. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can take a seat. Well, good morning to you all. My name is John. I get to be one of the pastors here at Willingdon. And uh, so glad that you're here. If you're here for the first time, we're really, really glad that you're here. Welcome, and uh, we invite you to just enjoy the service. If you would like to connect with us, we'd love to get to know you. Here's how you can do it. In front of you, there's an orange card. It says connect on it. Fill it out, and then after the service, head straight across the lobby to what we call our welcome center. At the welcome center, there's a team of people who would love to answer any questions that you might have about Willingdon, and they'll also set you up with a free lunch, and that's really good, too. Uh, also in front of you, you will see a uh, purple envelope. It says offering on it. And uh, we would invite you to consider giving as an act of worship. The Lord provides everything that we have. And one of the ways that we continue to worship is by reinvesting some of the things that he's given us into his kingdom work. So you can fill out the envelope and put, put cash or check in there. Or there's ways to give online. And so thank you for that. And may the Lord bless you as you worship him in that way. A uh, couple of schedule kind of announcements. Next Saturday, November 11th, uh, from 2 till 4 p.m., men's ministry is having an event here. And uh, Pastor Vin will teach about the discipline of work. So how does our job, our day-to-day -day life, get lived for God's glory? So it's going to be a wonderful time together. You need to buy a ticket, five bucks, snacks, coffee, worth the five dollars. So I'd encourage you to to uh, sign up. Also, uh, not this coming Wednesday evening, but the following Wednesday, which is November, November 15th in the evening, 7 p.m., uh, we're hosting a global mission dessert night. And what we're going to do that evening is highlight all of our missionaries from around the world and talk about short-term mission engagements and stuff like that. So we would love to see you there. You need to buy a ticket within this next couple of days, and uh, it's going to be worth your time to be there. Also, in the lobby this today and next week as well, you can pick up Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. And uh, uh, just one idea for you. Last night I was at a party, a shoebox filling party. Here's a picture of a whole bunch of us gathered. We brought our stuff, filled boxes together, and uh, there's one more slide that shows you the pile of boxes that we put together. So maybe think of this as a social event. Maybe your life group could do it or something like that. So I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, now there's a video announcement. an incredible Christmas story. It's a story of transformation. But we're, we're bringing it with kind of fresh life, fresh way of actually telling it through the lens of carolers that actually talk directly to the audience. A lot of interactive things, a lot of dance, a lot of the choir is going to be a huge part of it. We have an orchestra. Uh, the dancing is going to be phenomenal. I think people are going to be really surprised uh, when they see this. It's not like anything they have seen before. So they're going to love it. just the dynamics of the cast and us getting all together and, and we're looking forward to having a good production and a gospel presentation at the end. Doing things like this creative, it takes a team 
And that's my favorite part to see people pull together, do something bigger than, than they thought they could do. And they do it, and it's amazing. It's really fun. It's really cool to see everybody working together. And the dances, I absolutely love. They look amazing. It's a really classic story, and I think it's told in a way that's really fresh and really exciting. And ultimately, uh, it's a great way to usher in the true meaning of the season. Tickets are on sale next week on Sunday. You're gonna wanna make sure that you get your tickets out in the lobby. We also, uh, for the performances, there's five performances. We're gonna be having dessert nights as well after the performances. You can buy an additional ticket for one of those. It's gonna be a great time. Invite friends, invite strangers, people. Bring people to come and share Christmas together. Bah, all you filthy urchins out there. Those are the little ones and you mature urchins. Come see Christmas Carol, bring your friends. I want to see you there, and if I don't, I will haunt you. My spirits will come after you. See you there. <laughs> That's a hard act to follow. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 17, starting at verse 14. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? He said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay for the tax? He said, yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. So our passage begins today with the story of a father and a son. Uh, and if you know who I am, my name is Brody. My dad is Scrooge. <laughs> so if you need help parenting a guy like me, we have a, a family ministries booth outside with Pastor Isaac, and he's hosting a, a parenting seminar, so you can learn how to deal with me and my brother and my sister and my sister, so that you don't become a Scrooge with your kids, okay? <laughs> Today is the last day to sign up for that conference. Would love to see you there, um, but I can promise you my father is not a Scrooge at home. He's only going to be a Scrooge here on stage. Uh, but do, do come out not only for the seminar, but also for uh, the Christmas Carol. So, as we end today's text, uh, I was thinking about this this week, and um, I think we're all familiar with days that start off a lot different than the way that they end. Things don't always go the way that we expect. We might start the day in a great mood. We got an extra hour of sleep. Um, I know I did. I hope you took advantage of that as well. You weren't just like, oh, I'll stay up till one o'clock because it's going to be midnight anyways. 
take advantage of your sleep, get a good rest, but you know, you have a good day's rest, you have a good breakfast, you get started on your day. And then little by little, things start to chip away at you. You're a minute late for work because you got caught behind a slow driver. And it always seems like the slow drivers are out one minute after you're supposed to have left the house, right? It just feels that way. Maybe the coffee spills on us. Someone yells at us. We forgot an assignment. Or bigger things happen. We get a call with bad news. We get into a fender bender. Dinner doesn't come out of the oven as expected. The baby won't fall asleep. Or Zach and Brody, my brother, are busy kicking each other instead of doing their homework as they grow up. Things don't always go the way that we expect. We know what it's like to experience ways, days that don't go the way that we hope. And today we join the disciples as they experience a day in the life of Jesus that doesn't go the way that they expect. Last week we studied the transfiguration of Jesus. He was shining brilliantly like the sun, his glory as the son of God revealed to his three closest disciples. He stood with Moses, he stood with Elijah, and God the Father himself spoke this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. It would have been fantastic to be there on that mountain. But now the disciples and Jesus have come down the mountain, and what they found at the foot was anything but fantastic. From glory to grief, from mountaintop to valley low, how do we make sense of what Matthew has recorded here? It may seem as we read that Matthew put these accounts side by side just because that's how they happened in the order uh, of Jesus' life. However, Matthew was a masterful uh, creator. He was masterful in his arrangement. His gospel is the most structured of the four gospels, and his emphasis is Jesus as Messiah. In today's passage, we see the Messiah fulfilling God's purposes in three ways. God's power, God's plan, and God's provision. And ultimately, God's purposes are found and fulfilled in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the risen Messiah and Lord. So, let's see God's power in this first account. Verses 14 to 16 again. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and, kneeling before him, said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. So Jesus leaves his mountain moment and enters a crowd of chaos. And in Mark's gospel, in his version of this account, he wrote, And when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and scribes arguing with them. These disciples were the nine that were left behind when Jesus took his closest three up for his transfiguration. So what's going on? Although Matthew doesn't immediately identify that the boy's condition is spiritual in nature, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record this account uh, of this healing, and they say it is the work of a demon. And we see in verse 18, Jesus addresses the demon directly. The boy's father approaches Jesus because the disciples could not heal his son, thus the argument that they were having with the scribes. This father was one among many who desperately wanted Jesus to do something for them. And we can pause here already. Do you find yourself in a circumstance that only God can fix? Do you need God to step in and show up, but you feel like he's gone missing? We often find ourselves in desperate situations. Each day has enough worry and trouble of its own, and we may barely have the strength to hold on. Where is God in the midst of pain and loss and disease and doubt? You might be good at turning to the Lord when you're in need, or maybe you're the type to get angry or question God's goodness when things go wrong. We can live one moment on our mountaintops with God and the next in the pits of despair. But rest assured, God sees you. So let's see how Jesus responds to this desperate situation. Verses 17 and 18. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? 
How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. There is no power greater than God. He's in charge. We just sang that this morning, right? The demon left with a single command from Jesus, and the boy was immediately better. Jesus silenced every enemy that stood in the way of God's purposes, even demons, even death. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. But we can't ignore how Jesus addressed the crowds. Jesus displayed God's power to a crowd he just called faithless and twisted. Jesus saw both desperation and deficiency. The crowd's lack of faith bothered him. Again, in Mark's version, the boy's father said, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus, indignant, replied, if you can, This was the one who fed the five and the four thousand with a handful of fish and bread. The one who healed throughout Israel. The one who went toe-to-toe with the religious authorities. The one proclaiming good news for all people. If anyone can, Jesus can. And that's the point. Jesus can. Jesus continued his exclamation. If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. Help me in my unbelief. Although Jesus bemoaned that this crowd still didn't understand, he was compassionate to their plight. He was not impatient, and he healed the boy with a single command. There is no doubt that God's power is found in Jesus. After healing the boy, Jesus and his disciples talked privately about what had just happened. So verses 19 and 20. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? He said to them, because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, if you have your Bible open, stay in the text. That was verse 20. The next verse is verse 22. The last time I checked, it should be verse 21. What's going on? Your Bible might have a footnote where verse 21 is kept, and mine says this. Uh, Some manuscripts insert verse 21, but this kind never never comes out except by prayer and fasting. This verse is left out because there's scholarly debate on whether or not it was in Matthew's original manuscript. But Mark's account of this incident has Jesus saying, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And even that verse has a footnote that says, some manuscripts add, and fasting. So what are we to make of all this? Well, first, let me remind us that the scriptures are reliable. Even after thousands of years, God has preserved his word through the copying and the translation. This is not a matter of textual error. This is a matter of textual emphasis. Jesus emphasized a deficiency in the faith of his followers. They were not off the hook. When Jesus called the crowd a faithless and twisted generation, he was talking to his disciples too. The disciples experienced a one step forward, two steps back kind of faith sometimes. Jesus grew their faith so they would understand God's purposes and be useful in his kingdom. Now today, false teachers spout all kinds of heresy about how we're supposed to grow our faith. They might say that all you need is a little more faith to be prosperous or to be healed. All you have to do is send a donation to their ministry and it'll work this time. Oh, it didn't work this time? You didn't have enough faith. Your donation wasn't big enough. Try again. And on and on. But today's text shows us that's not how faith works. Jesus' healing miracles were often performed on those and for those with no faith at all. 
Faith is not a prerequisite to Jesus' compassion. I'm going to say it again because that might be all that you need to pull from today. Faith is not a prerequisite for Jesus' compassion. If it were, none of us would ever experience the love of God. Jesus said that all his disciples needed was tiny faith and mountains would move. Nothing would be impossible. Did the disciples lack even faith as small as a mustard seed? Arguably the smallest seed of the garden? As we hear these words, we might sit in our seats and squirm a little bit thinking about our own faith. How much do I have? Is it enough for God to love me, to be pleased with me? Am I enough? And again I say, rest assured. Jesus was not addressing the quantity of faith. He was addressing the quality of faith. What was the disciples' faith in? This is what Jesus wanted to teach them. And this is what Jesus wants to teach us. And this is where verse 21 can come back into effect. Jesus was not saying, pray more and it will happen. Have more faith and I'll move for you. Instead, by saying prayer, and yes, sometimes fasting, by saying these things are required to do these works, Jesus revealed that we need to be connected to the source of our faith. It's about the object of our faith, not the amount of our faith. Because we put our faith in all sorts of things all the time. We believe that since God did something in a certain way in the past, he'll do it the same way again. And we just sang, he's been faithful, he will be faithful, we will see it again and again, yes and amen. But not always the same way. But we think we need to recreate the circumstances for God to hear us better. A specific atmosphere, a person, a location in the city, the right words, the right number of candles, whatever it might be. As though our efforts will channel our prayers more clearly to the God who already knows all things, sees all things, hears all things. So at that point, what are we putting our faith in? We may think it's God, but really it's our own efforts. We put ourselves, we put our faith in ourselves and what we can do. And yet Jesus continuously calls us back so that our faith is only in him. It's not elaborate. It's not complicated. We don't need giant faith. We need genuine faith. We need a faith that is not found in formulas and rites and rituals, but instead is found in the faithful one himself. It's only Jesus that can work the power of God in our lives. Jesus continued to reveal this through this next account that we're jumping to. And we'll see that God's purposes are made evident as we consider God's plan. So first his power, but also his plan. Verse 22. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. The crowds dispersed. Jesus is again with his disciples teaching. This is at least the second time when he's taught them on his death and resurrection. But the language suggests that Jesus was continuously teaching them along the way about this as they went to Jerusalem, as they got closer to his death. When Jesus said the Son of Man was about to be delivered into the hands of men, the language could also be betrayed. And this incites our minds to conjure up images of Judas and the silver that he got in exchange for selling out Jesus. But was it just Judas that delivered Jesus to be crucified? There's more going on here than meets the eye. Judas delivered Jesus in a human sense, but it was God who directed Jesus to the cross. God did not betray Jesus by any means, but it was the will of the Father that his son would be delivered to death to make payment for the sins of the world. 
And this prophecy is everywhere in Scripture. From the promise of God in the garden at the first sin in Genesis 3 verse 15, to the Psalms of David, to the prophecies of Isaiah and Ezekiel, to the languishing of God's people throughout history. This has always been the mission. Jesus even prayed in the garden on the night of his betrayal that God would save us in a different way that didn't require his death. Matthew records this a couple of chapters from now. He says, Jesus prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. But then the submission, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus recognized that his purpose was to obey his father. He recognized that his joy and his glory came from surrendering to his father's will. Jesus believed that he would be raised. His faith was in his father. Even when this meant offending authorities or confusing people or walking away from power and prestige, Jesus never stepped outside God's will. Jesus was not afraid to surrender his life because he knew God's plan was better than any alternative. So a question for us. Do we attempt to orchestrate outcomes and control the circumstances of our lives? Or do we believe that God's way is better? We can trust that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. But that doesn't mean all things work out the way that we expect or the way that we hope. But it does mean that we can trust God's plans. He'll preserve us on our mountains and in our valleys. The disciples, they didn't really get it yet. They were greatly distressed that Jesus was even talking about his death. They couldn't grasp his coming resurrection. The same John that was at the transfiguration just before today's accounts said this about himself when he saw the empty tomb that first Easter morning. He wrote, Then the other disciple, that's John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture that he must be raised from the dead. And so often, we are like the disciples. And we're on this side of the resurrection. It's hard to know where our everyday stories are going until they're done. God urges us to have faith in him when we find ourselves stuck in the middle of the plot because his plans, his plans, are never stuck. So let's not think it's just the disciples that have something to learn today. We also have much to learn about trusting God's timing, about trusting his purposes. We have much to submit and much to understand. We will spend eternity learning the depths of God's wisdom and his purposes. But in our everyday lives, let's do as the Father commands and listen to Jesus. Let's not miss what God has already done so that we can have faith in what he is actively doing. And this moves us to consider God's provision. Jesus and his disciples, they're talking, they arrive in Capernaum where they meet some tax collectors. And I laugh a little bit at verses 24 to 27 because despite the rest of today's passage being in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, only the one-time tax collector Matthew includes this interaction with a couple of his buddies from his life before he came to know Jesus. So, you know, Matthew, like I said earlier, is purposeful in what he includes in his account. A little bit of a nod to some of his friends, maybe. Maybe they're laughing about it in heaven if the tax collectors got there too. Anyways, not sure. Some words that we don't recognize here, hey? The two drachma tax. That's uh, not an English word. What, uh, what do we do with that? That's a tax that was instituted in Exodus 30 by God through Moses to maintain the tabernacle. It was, uh, and the tabernacle is a place where God dwelled among his people, the Israelites. So every Jew over the age of 19 paid this tax, and it applied to the Jewish temple as well after the tabernacle was gone. 
So there's a question in verse 24 that the tax collectors ask. Does your teacher not pay the tax? And they pose it in a way that expects a positive answer. It could be read, your teacher pays the tax to support the house of God, does he not? And Peter, quick with his mouth, replies, yes. And then Jesus privately took this opportunity to reveal more of his identity to his disciples and to us. Jesus spoke using a parable in verses 25 and 26, talking about the kings of the earth and the taxes that his people pay. And Peter understood that a king would not subject his own family to the taxes that his subjects would have to pay. What Jesus is acknowledging was his right as the son of God to forego the tax on the house of God. The son of God need not pay the tax since he is the royal heir. Don't miss this because people will claim that Jesus never made claims that he was God. This is a divine statement that he's making. He's equating himself with God. He's affirming Peter's earlier declaration in Matthew 16. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. So the temple tax should not apply to Jesus. And yet, Jesus chooses to pay it. In verse 27, he says, let's not give offense to them. Let's not cause offense. Jesus provided both his and Peter's portion of the tax by a miracle. We don't see the conclusion, but Matthew expects us to assume that Peter really did go fishing and really did fish up a money fish. But Jesus had every right to refuse this tax, and he still chose to do so. As followers of Jesus, we don't belong to an earthly kingdom, and yet God commands us to obey the earthly governing authorities that he has allowed to rule over us. Hard sometimes. We may want to resist laws that make no sense to us, but laws and taxes are for our benefit as well. In another account, just to add to that, the religious leaders ask if they should be paying taxes to Caesar. When presented with a coin, Jesus asked whose image was on it. And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. God has provided much and we are expected to care for our fellow man, and submit to the authorities that God has allowed to rule over us. However, just as the image of Caesar was on their coins, the image of God was on their lives. We are all made in the image of God, whether you believe in him or not. We are all made in the image of God. And if you do believe, and if you do declare yourself a follower of God, then you'd best give your life, we would best give our lives to the service of his kingdom. And so the question comes back to us. Whose kingdom are we serving? Are we serving God's kingdom? Or are we trying to serve our own? We, uh, when we come up against situations where we feel that our rights are being trampled or ignored or what have you, how will we respond? Because we could give in to negative legalism. We could be stubborn. We could be stuck in our ways. Or we can seek to love and demonstrate God's gracious compassion, even if we have to forego our rights to do so. This is more complicated than one morning of sermon can get into, but Jesus never gave up his identity as God's beloved son. He never stopped being God, but that didn't overshadow the work that he came to do. May we never allow our identity as God's children to be the reason we refuse to be gracious or submissive. Instead, our identity as God's children should be the very reason that we pray for our government, that we join our fellow man in pursuing true justice, that we seek to better society in ways that reveal God's purposes in every venture in which we participate. The gospel frees us 
to let go of our rights and embrace our belonging in God's kingdom. And there will be a day when that submission is rewarded. But Jesus is saying more, so don't, don't get lost in that. This tax was recorded in Exodus 30, verses 11 to 16, and the last verse there stands out. You shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the kingdom of meeting, or sorry, to the tent of meeting, that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord, so as to make atonement for your lives. Some interesting language there. Atonement money. The service of the tent of meeting. Remembrance. God's purposes are on display through his power and his plan and his provision, but he provides more than money. Sometimes I wish I could just go fishing and and pull up money fish. That would be great. But I can't fish, so it wouldn't work. They're out there, I'm sure. But God has provided his own son to atone for our lives. Atone means to cover over, in case that's an unfamiliar word. Atone means to cover over. Jesus pays a tax in today's passage that he has no business paying. He freely offers to pay a fee that he has not incurred. And in the same way, when Jesus went to the cross, he paid a price that wasn't his. He paid the price we deserve to pay for our sin. Jesus on the cross made atonement for us. By his death, God provides the only way for us to be free, for us to live. And though the disciples did not yet understand, his resurrection secured our salvation. We believe we will rise again one day because Jesus already has. Death has no hold on us. We are free. We've become sons of God through the Son of God. And we are invited into his house. We are made heirs of the promise, all of us, through the Son of God. The wages of sin are paid off in full. All that remains is life for anyone who believes. And what did Jesus say about belief? All things are possible for one who believes. So this day, whether you do already or you don't, believe Jesus. Don't just believe in Jesus, but actually believe what he has to say. Believe him. Trust in his sacrifice on the cross. Don't put your faith in lesser things. I'm a lesser thing, and I put my faith in me way too often. Don't put your faith in lesser things. Don't believe in formulas and patterns. Believe instead in the Son of God who loves you and died to bring you home. Trust in his power, his plan, his provision. Let God work out his purposes in your life. Again, as John writes in his gospel, that you would receive eternal life, that they would know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's eternal life. Life is a person. And he invites you to come. So may our lives be forever changed as we put our faith in Jesus day after day, moment by moment. Amen? Amen. We get to celebrate this truth as we take communion this morning. As we come to the table, we remember the atoning payment that Jesus made on our behalf. Maybe that language is lost a little bit on you. Jesus took the shame of the cross so that we could be honored as royalty in God's family. Jesus took the fear of death and separation from the Father forever and by his power has given us power over the grave too. We find all that we need in him. We get to join God's family because of Jesus. He fulfilled what he foretold, that yes, he died, but he would rise. And now we, along with the disciples, can proclaim the wonder of God's grace and his extravagant love. 
And so I invite the servers this morning to come down to the front as we get ready for communion. The bread this morning, as we pass it this morning, uh, it represents the body of Jesus given for us on the cross as he physically took our place in death. The cup represents Jesus' blood, which was spilled for us. The Bible says life is in the blood. And when we are covered, again, that atonement, when we are covered by the blood of Jesus, we receive life through him. We are covered. Our sins are taken away and we are brought to life in him and for him. So it's our custom here as we take communion, we're going to pass the trays with the bread around and then once everyone is served, I'll be back up here and I will lead us in taking it together. And then we'll pass the trays with the cups and again, I'll come up to the front and I will lead us in taking it together. If you're here today and you declare Jesus to be the risen Messiah, the Lord of your life, then you are welcome to participate in this declaration to remember what Jesus has accomplished for you, for us. And if you're here today and you have yet to believe Jesus, then I'm really glad that you get to see this and participate in witnessing God's faithfulness. But I just ask that you pass the trays by. Everyone has passed the tray at some point until they've made a declaration of faith in Jesus. But I do urge you, consider the invitation that Jesus makes to have your sins covered, to have your death paid, and to receive life through the only one who has the power over the grave. Another custom at Willingdon is to take a moment to pray and confess any lingering sin or to simply thank God for what he has done and what he has accomplished through his wonderful mercy and compassion. So we say with the father of that boy in our passage today, help us in our unbelief and our good father hears us. So let's come again to our father. Let's remember the sacrifice of his son, which leads to the forgiveness of sin and the salvation of many. Take a moment to pray and then I'll lead us. Father, we thank you that you have shown your love to us by sending Christ to die even while we were far away from you. You have made payment, you have restored honor, and you have conquered death in power. You are victorious, Jesus, and today we remember. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. I invite our brother Winston to pray the blessing over the bread. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this bread, the symbol of your body broken for us. We remember your words saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We gratefully remember with grateful hearts your death on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Help us to partake of this bread in a manner that honors your immense love for us. We renew our commitment to listen to, obey, and follow you. In your glorious name we pray, amen.
and eat. It is my body given for you. So let us do that in remembrance of him. I invite our brother Ken to come and pray the blessing over the cup. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we hold in our hands a symbol of your giving all of us, uh, all of you yourself to us, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the blood that uh, this represents. Lord, it wasn't that we were good that you gave it to us, but while we were yet sinners, you died for us. What a miracle. What grace and mercy that you demonstrated on the cross. So I just pray that you would just bless us as we think of this, um, this glorious grace that you've provided for us and may it deepen our faith in you and love, as well as coming to you, those that hear it for the first time, Lord. In your precious holy name, Jesus, amen.
In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take this and as often as you drink it, remember me. So let us drink and remember together. Father God, we come before you humbly, recognizing that the work that you performed was in some ways unnecessary because there is no, we don't deserve the love that you showed. And yet, simply by your being love, you saw fit to bring us into salvation. Father God, you did not withhold your own son from us. And Jesus, you did not pass by the cross. Yet for the joy that was set before you, you endured the cross, you scorned its shame, and now you are seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And Father, in the mystery of salvation, you've declared that we are seated with your Son, righteous, holy, saved, redeemed. You have saved. You're in the process of saving. And there will be a day, Jesus, when we look you face to face and we will see our salvation with our very eyes. Until that day, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would draw us to faithfulness. Father, may your love be what comes out of us. Father, may your joy be what is on our face. In our mountains and our valleys, may we remember that you go before us, but that you also go with us. And that your loving kindness follows us all the days of our lives. Lord, we give you thanks. And we pray this all in your most powerful name. And the body of Christ said, Amen. 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 I invite you to stand as we continue to celebrate. We're going to be passing buckets with the uh, communion servers to pass your cups to the aisles. But let's continue to sing and remember. Sing, you've been. You've been so, so good to me. You've been so, so Second Corinthians as we go this week. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. As you go this week, you take 
the love of God. You take the joy of Jesus. You take the fellowship of the Spirit. And as we remembered here, we now get to live that life that Jesus has given. So go with him, knowing he's going to do wild and crazy things, but knowing that we can trust him no matter what the plan is. Amen? Amen. We'll see you soon.